In Hong Kong, for the last generation, I made you have a choice. Dot com. You'll be public candidate I did for governor. Not have sexual relations. I realize that this is something we are not going to be able to solve our problems if we get distracted by sideshows and carnival barkers. One Republican, one Democrat, and you discuss the issues that matter in today's local, state, national, and global politics. Hosted by Steve Hickson, with co-hosts John Stanberry and Franklin Chancy. This is Backfire. Hey, good morning, Cleveland. Welcome to Whoop Radio Station here at the Village Green Town Center with another exciting week of Whoop Backfire. Uh, John and uh, Franklin are here in the studio with me. And uh, guys, is there anything particular you want to talk about first this morning? We'll go wherever you want to go, Steve. You think uh, you think um, um, uh, Hillary Clinton will be as good a liar as her husband was? Bill Clinton, you know, he was really good at it. Well, you know, I, I said when they were in office, there was a difference between the two of them. And, and most people that were from Arkansas when he was governor said this. Bill didn't really believe in anything. Bill was a good politician, and, and he wanted to be elected. He had ambition, which is not a bad thing. But he was willing to go wherever he needed to go to win. Hillary, they said, was much more of a true believer. And so... I don't know. I don't know whether that, you know, I think Bill's much more bendable. Where do I need to be? I think Hillary's pretty good at, at politics, but I think she's probably more of a true believer. Yeah. Franklin, you got any response to my question? <laughs> well, I think that uh, Hillary Clinton has gotten tons of praise from people on both sides of the aisle this the last, last four years. I have no reason to think she'll be anything other than what she's always been, which is uh, competent and straightforward. That's what I expect. Well, I'm, I I wouldn't quite say she's straightforward. The, the reason she's gotten a lot of praise is because we've been shocked at how bad everyone around her is in this administration. <laughs> you know, as much as I didn't want her to win, in retrospect, I would have probably liked four years of her more than four years of Obama. Yeah. Well, I can only say that uh, lots of Republicans in uh, Washington who are elected, who are on the Foreign Relations Committee and so forth, for the most part, have been very uh, effusive in their praise of the job she's done in the last four years. And so I don't really know what John's talking about. Well, now, frankly, I didn't say, I, I don't think she's done a poor job. I think within the constraints that the Obama foreign policy has placed on her, I think she's tried to do the best she can. And I think she is very competent in being able to uh, work. You know, foreign relations is basically politics and diplomacy. And I do th I'm not saying she hasn't done a good job. I don't agree with the direction that the administration has sort of pushed her towards. And I'm not sure she's always agreed with it. Well, first of all, that's not the Secretary of State's job to set policy, number one. Uh, number two, I have heard that kind of vague assertion over the last couple of years from the Republican Party, but I've yet to hear any concrete steps as to what they should have done. Uh, what does that mean? Uh, you guys say we should be tougher, but you don't tell us what that means. Does that mean we're supposed to invade some more countries? 
No, Franklin. It means what are we that, talking about? It means that if you're in a, in a country that is basically a lawless state and you send the ambassador in, you send a Marine detachment with him. It does well, mean some that, concrete things that, like that. That's all fine and good, but I've seen a lot of articles about that in the last few weeks also uh, with a lot of different ambassadors in different countries talking. And they basically said we would not be able to do our jobs if we did that. If, if we what, the, had protection? If we had marine detachments following us all over the country. Franklin, there's a marine detachment in Paris. They don't follow the ambassador I didn't when say he goes following. to McDonald's. There, and, and Paris has not been Gazi. Well, I know that, John. But I also know that there are lots of factors that go into that. For example, one of the things that will get discussed today uh, when uh, the Secretary of State has her testimony in front of the congressional committee that you guys implied would never happen or that she had the Benghazi well, flu for four months Hold on, let me four finish. months later after Hold the on. election so so after, when yeah. that's when that's going to happen is that I didn't know this there's a law that was been on the books for about 20 years now that law requires the state department to bid out security to local groups to the lowest bidder and it was passed ostensibly so that American companies would have some sort of advantage in the competitive bidding process. So we actually contract this stuff out to the lowest bidder, and they're required to try and use local groups, supposedly to try to develop relationships with those folks. I guess there's a purpose for that, but that may not be the most efficient and most and most effective way to provide security for these types of facilities. But that's a law they're required but to But Franklin, that still won't answer the nagging questions of why was repeated calls for increased security ignored? Why did the ambassador on the day of his death talk about how dangerous and how at risk he felt like he was? Why have the survivors of that not been able to testify, not been seen since? Why has nobody, the only one person in custody and through our wonderful relations that we now have with the rest of the world, he's now been released. Not a single person has been brought to trial, to justice, to, to anything to answer for this. On top of the fact that the administration actually lied and, and told the public that we've dismissed the four people that the uh, report found responsible, and yet we find out they didn't actually dismiss them, they just moved them around. Uh, yeah, they didn't retire, did they? They they retired they that part of their job, but then took over another job somewhere else. Yeah. No comment, Franklin. Well, no, I could comment <laughs> on it all day long. This has been a bunch of political uh, nonsense. Well, do you not think? No, the, listen. Right, wait a minute. If the four people ambassador, were identified, should they not have been punished? Ambassadors all over the country, all over the country, all over the country have issued statements talking about what the nature of their jobs are and how their jobs require them to go into dangerous places and to take risks and that's part of it. I'm not saying we shouldn't be looking at security and so forth. What I am telling you is that the way that you guys have politicized this it's been shameful. There's no way to do it, Franklin. Of because course the, there no, is. No, there's not, because this administration won't come forward with any facts, and then as soon as you push for the fact, you're labeled as being political. That's, that's I mean, the true. fact of the matter is the, the ambassador that died for months begged for greater security, for months said the situation was deteriorating and was put away. Matter of fact, and the, you a, the— And you act like that's the only ambassador in the world— it's the only ambassador in a country that had just collapsed and, and weapons of all kinds no, of it destruction wasn't the only were ambassador. floating everywhere. It's not the only ambassador that definition applies to. And interestingly enough, and I'm going to give a shout out to a Republican here, uh, our senator is serving on the Foreign Relations Committee, which will be talking about this today and will be interviewing Senator uh, uh, Secretary Clinton. And uh, Bob Kerry, who'd served with him, is going to be our new Secretary of State, had this in the paper this morning about our John, senator. John Kerry. Yeah, John Kerry, I'm sorry. Bob's smart as they come. He's a straight shooter even when you disagree. He always does his homework, and he always asks the tough questions that need to be asked of both sides. He hasn't been out aggrandizing this. I've seen him on TV several times, and he's asked some serious questions about this, but they were valid ones, and they were ones that weren't offered in a hysterical fashion. They were offered in a way designed 
to really try to find out what the facts are without but being He probably can't thing. say no. what he really thinks. Franklin, so. Why ask. not? All of his other colleagues <laughs> were. Franklin, we're not being hysterical. Let me just ask a simple question. If there are if there's actual uniformed Marines standing on guard in the embassy in Paris, France, what in anybody's reasonable sense of, of, of thoughtfulness would you think you need a uniformed Marine guarding the ambassador in Paris, France, but not a uniformed Marine guarding the ambassador in Libya? Well, one reason, John, is because we have military facilities all over France that we don't have all over Libya. Wouldn't it's not as simple it was even as you more talk important about. to have some Marines guarding the ambassador? You know what, John? With your Republican Party's That's agenda <laughs> of wanting to always throw money into the Defense Department, by gosh, bring it on. Open your checkbook talk, up and pay for it. Franklin, about, they, had, they had hundreds of millions of dollars in surplus sitting in that line item. After they said they couldn't afford it, right, they, they found out there was hundreds of millions of dollars so in me, surplus. Now, let me, let me get, if I got this straight. We have hundreds of millions of dollars in surplus. In that line item. And you claim the Defense Department's budget can't be cut. Actually, that was in the State Department's let's, budget, let's talk, not the Defense Department. Let's talk about uh, today. Hillary will be testifying today, am I right? What That's time correct. What time does that take place, do you know? I'm not sure. I don't know. You know, John? I don't. Anyway, um, I'm, you think they'll be asking her any really tough questions, or, uh, or, or what do you think is going to happen well, from this? Why, why would you think the Republicans who are on that committee wouldn't ask her tough questions? Well, why would I you mean, not, what's, what, what does that mean? Why would you not think the American citizens deserve tough questions to be asked? Who said there shouldn't be? Well, then why are I've you complaining? That. Then why are you complaining I'm about Republicans complaining. asking tough questions? He just said, and he I said, will anybody ask tough questions? If the Americans questions. deserve it, why aren't the Democrats asking it? Who says they're not? I haven't heard anybody who's serving on that committee issuing any of these statements, the ones who've been in the closed-door classified briefings, they're not coming out on the news and Actually, making all these wild Bob charges. Bob Corker walked out of one of the classified briefings right after this happened and said that was the biggest waste of his time he had ever seen. He said what was on his mind that time, didn't he? Well, okay, good for him. <laughs> all right, we're moving on along. We had the, uh, let's, let's, uh, let me hear from our uh, engineer here a little bit. All right, that was the uh, Lee, Lee University singers at the inauguration uh, of President Obama in Washington, D.C. And uh, anyway, it's great that we have a school here that's local that has uh, uh, been thought of uh, well enough to be able to go to something like this. I think it's a great event. They did a wonderful job. Yeah, they worked hard. Put, that's a combined, you know, kind of like a super chorus, and, and they worked really hard on that. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you... What's your opinions? And I'll ask you first, Franklin. What What do you think? What was your opinion of the inaugural speech? Well, from a pure speech making position, I think it was far superior to the president's first speech. Uh, I think it was a speech that was um, confident in nature. Uh, I think that it's a speech that was de designed to establish negotiating positions for the route that's going forward. Uh, I think he put forth uh, some strident uh, and confident uh, assertions about his view of what the government should and shouldn't do, but that's going to be the starting point for any discussions that take place uh, uh, over the next few months with Congress. John, your opinion? Well, um you know, he borrowed a lot of phrasing from uh, Abraham Lincoln because I think his ego wants to beg that comparison. The problem is Abraham Lincoln, during a horrible time in American history, sought to uh, bring both sides together. Uh, there was absolutely no outreach whatsoever to the 47% of the voting population that doesn't particularly completely agree with him. 
uh, Franklin, <laughs> there was no outreach at all. Abraham Lincoln sought to bring both sides Actually, together. Actually, if you, if you re- well, sure, with a military war that no, lasted in, four in years. No, in his inaugural, <laughs> inaugural address, Franklin, he actually sought to try to bring the country back together and heal the wounds. His this, first or second address his are we second, talking about? The, his okay. second. Okay, well, we which is the one that, a war, oh, John. And he was trying, we just finished an we election. We haven't finished a war. Franklin, we just finished an, an election. Where was the uh, outreach to the other side? And on top of that, what you had was, this is the most amazing part. If you're one of the millions of Americans who are out of work, if you're one of the millions of people that have quit looking for work, if you're underemployed, you got absolutely no mention whatsoever. He didn't mention the economy one single time. So the largest pressing problem of our country, he skipped over. And what did he do? He did the same thing he did four years ago. He's taken us into partisan fights on social uh, situations. We've gone in, you know, the gay rights fight. We're going to have all of these liberal social agenda fights. But you know what? People need jobs. We need to be talking about the economy. There wasn't a single mention of the struggling economy in the entire speech. Well, first of all, all of the journalism has now been done over the last few months, and it's all been aired on television. So let's talk about what's actually happened. Uh, The president gave his first inaugural address four years ago, and in that speech, there wasn't a lot of partisan tone. As a matter of fact, liberals were howling over the fact that it wasn't very partisan at all and it was so bipartisan. What do we know now? We know that the leadership of the Republican Party met that very night. They met that night and decided on their strategy for the next four years, and that strategy was we are going to oppose every single thing the president does and are going to provide no support at all. That was an, an actual policy that they worked out for themselves. Frank, now, hold Frank, on, I'm no, not I done. Ask a and let's question. go on a little just further. To, I just want to ask a question to understand this. Which House of Congress did they control that they could shut his agenda down at that point? The Speaker of the House? No, 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 he wasn't Eric Speaker. Cantor? He wasn't Speaker. Nancy okay, Pelosi the minority was. Leader. Nancy Fine. Pelosi Fine, was the speaker. John. Harry Reid was the leader Fine. in the Senate. But here's the the strategy they worked out. They were going to oppose this president even when he promoted ideas they had promoted. And they had enough promoted. votes to break what legislation? They had enough to shut down the no, Senate. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. Oh, Franklin. they did. Uh, and then so that's why Obama, a, that's a, why Obamacare there, there failed a, in the Senate, there right? Is a, there is a reason. Franklin, why, is that why Obamacare failed in the Senate? There is a reason why that this Senate has had twice as many filibusters as any Congress in the history of our nation. Yeah, because twice Harry Reid's a poor leader. Twice as many, and they've all come from that side. Think we'll get a budget? Well, the, the House yes. Republicans have finally actually, I think, played some smart politics. They said, fine, you want a debt ceiling uh, uh, raise, we'll raise it for three months, which is not long enough, but it's, it's long enough to keep us from you know, going supposedly uh, in, in, into receivership. But we're not going to raise it again until the Senate Democrats pass a budget, which they haven't done in three years. And here's the best part. If they don't pass the budget, they're going to cut off all congressional pay. Now, that's the Republicans. You don't do your job. You don't follow the federal law. You don't pass a budget like you haven't done for three years. We're going to cut the pay off to all of us. Now, wait a minute. They were, it seems like the Democrats have been threatening that if they do that, that the uh, people won't be able to get their Social Security checks. Well, that's so another, forth. that's another, basically, you talk about Obama uses the reference of a gun to the head of the American right. people. He can pay whatever bills he wants to. Most reasonable presidents who really cared about people and really cared about working something out would say, okay, we're going to go into the budget if we really did run into that problem, and we're going to not pay some non-essentials. What does he do? He threatens to not pay the most important important bills that we owe so that he can stir as many people up to get his way. Well, first of all, I'm glad to see that you now consider Social Security to be the most important bill we owe. It's one of the most important well, bills we amen. owe. It's we also, might actually have something to right, talk Franklin, about. You're right, Franklin. It's also on the road to insolvency if we don't fix it. But, of course, there was no reference to that in the inaugural address either. Uh, have you been out the firing range uh, warming up your guns or anything lately, John? We can't buy any shells. I was down at uh, Sportsman's Warehouse. <laughs> They've all been bought. They have been bought, Franklin. You can laugh all you want. <laughs> I am laughing. There, there's a wall. It's, the, the gun industry There are has no guns on the wall. Guys. There are no bullet. Well, Franklin. <laughs> they fleeced you. They didn't fleece us they've at all. Exactly. Do, that's what they've done. They've fleeced you. Who's made they? a killing. 
the, the gun lobby. Well, actually, Franklin, you know, if you I don't think, I don't think they, ple- I don't think they please team body. I think the the the, the way uh, our country is being run, I think they, the world's they, scared. They, they waltzed in, convinced you that everything was going away, and made a killing. No, Franklin, it's beautiful. Most people can see <laughs> writing on the wall, and you you know what people believe, and people want to be protected and they want to make sure they have their options available and they're reasonably sure that this group of people in Washington right now, the president and his leaders in Congress, are intent on taking away the right of the people to to exercise their constitutional right to own a weapon, to own their firearms, to be able to shoot their firearms. There's not a shred of evidence. There's all kinds of evidence, Franklin. If you can't see that, you don't want to see it. You have simply talked yourself into all these myths over the years that have nothing to do with facts. Nobody's trying to take your handgun away. Actually, Nobody's trying to take your handgun away. Actually, that's not away. true. Do you want me to give you the quotes of the leaders pushing the assault weapons ban who say, ultimately, we don't think people ought to own any guns? Here's you what want I hear, know. You want to hear Schumer? Here's what I know. You want to hear Dianne Feinstein? Here's what I know. I know a majority of the American people support the right to keep and bear arms. I know that a majority of the American people don't support assault weapons. Why can't we find middle ground based upon what the majority of us want? Because the majority of the people uh, don't understand what an assault weapon is or isn't. They don't understand that you talk about being uh, having fleeced. That's the real fleecing going. Let me give you an example. When, When military generals come forward and say there are certain weapons out there that have no civilian use whatsoever, can we not agree on that? No, you can't, Franklin. Oh, okay. Because so. there's no... Here's the problem. You all play on this idea that when you use the term assault weapon, the vast majority of people out there that don't own guns, they think you're talking about machine guns. And they, rightly so, will go, sure, nobody should own a machine gun. The problem is that's not what an assault weapon is. There is no actual such... For example, Franklin, the new New York law says if any gun has any of these traits of an assault rifle, it's an assault rifle. Let me give you one of the traits. A pistol grip. Now... I I don't know how little people who don't own guns understand about that, but that's a handle at the bottom of the gun that you grab a hold of with your right fist. Now, you explain to me how the fact that a gun has a pistol grip on it makes it any deadlier than a gun that doesn't have a pistol grip on it. Well, the law you're talking about requires more than just no, one of No, it requires one. You go back and read it. It requires now, John, one. That... California requires two, but new, the new New York law requires one. It looks bad. Well, I mean, think about that. It's a handle that you hold with your hand. That's all that is. Well, it has the, nothing the, the, to do the with the to functioning that, the of the to gun. The that question is that when the original assault weapons ban was passed in 1994, um, uh, that particular aspect of it was used as a way to get around the assault weapons ban. Um, basically, manufacturers went in and redesigned the look and feel of their weapons so they could get around that's it. because that's the list of guns franklin was picked by the look had nothing to do with the function the original one didn't pick that that you're wrong franklin uh metzenbaum in ohio which was one of the leaders and the writers of the original assault weapons band sat down with a gun atlas book and he he admitted this flipped through the book and if the picture of the gun looked scary he put it on the list so that's the type of intensive I, research I'm, that went into that ban. I'm curious, John, what you thought of the executive actions that the president took uh, on the gun control issue. I thought a lot of it, if he if he does some of it, see, here's one of the problems with his executive action speech. We don't know how much of that he's actually going to do through executive action. Some of it, if he does it, he will invoke a constitutional crisis. Well, he gave 23 specific executive actions. I'm asking what you thought about it. Well, here's what I think. I think he's uh, going to end up uh, hiring another, oh, what do you think, 150,000 people or something? Well, to, he's already bought to, million, hundreds keep, of millions of ammo for to, him. Well, so, yeah. I mean. I mean, he's going to be hiring more people. It expands the federal government. And expand the federal government. This whole program, there's nothing here but an opportunity to grow the government even And Franklin, larger. there's which some real... The, I'm asking you, right, I'll give you a, these acts, what, I'll give you you a these real actions? civil libertarian problem, and I'm not the kind to normally make these arguments. But, for example, years ago, if you came to your doctor and you had syphilis or gonorrhea, 
he would report that to the Center for Disease Control or the local health department, and they would interview you, and they'd say, we need a list of all your sexual partners because this is a communicable disease, and we've got to protect the rest of the public from you spreading it. Now, when AIDS came along, it became politically uh, unpopular and, and just wrong to ask anybody those kind of questions. So even though that policy had been tremendously successful in stopping the spread of syphilis and gonorrhea and other communicable diseases, we outlawed the health department from asking a AIDS patient about their partners because that was a violation of rights. Now, in this gun control bill, what he's doing is he's empowering doctors to ask you whether you own a gun or not. And that doctor would then be able to report that to the government and say, you know what, I think this guy's unstable. I think this guy. Now, we want mental health evaluations, but I don't think you want every uh, family practitioner out there keeping a record of which one of his patients own guns and which ones don't and reporting it to the government. You can't report a communicable disease that killed thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, but we were going to report your gun ownership? Actually, what the order says is that the previous law, which forbid a doctor from reporting any of that information, will now not be interpreted as forbidding them from doing it. It does not require the doctor to do Let anything. Me ask you, Frank, it, hold Frank, on, it frees them from a fear of liability if in their individual judgment they make a decision that an individual... It also asks the doctors to ask all their patients if they own guns or not. That's not what it says. Well, let me ask hmm. you a question, Franklin. If the doctor says, is not going to ask, a, wait a minute. If a doctor's not going to ask a patient if they own guns mm -hmm. or not, how will they know which patients to report might be a hazard with a gun? <laughs> if you're I a doctor, the, and you I got th a crazy th patient. Th that's the question right there. Huh? That's the that's the issue. The question is, if a doctor feels that somebody is suffering from a mental illness, are they then free to look into that information and to perhaps Why? report it? Why, Why not just report that they're crazy and let some other authority that actually deals well, with guns change deal with anything? Because you're empowering a whole other level of citizens to report on their fellow citizens. You're asking doctors to make judgment calls on guns. Franklin, they make know, judgment calls on people all the time. Not on their lifestyles. You're not going to have a doctor much longer. It's going to PA. It's going to be a physician's assistant. It's going to have to do it. Well, and frankly, here's another let, problem with let's, the, let's look. Let's, let's look at what these let me ask you a question. Did. Will those orders? Let's uh, twenty-three of them. It's what two pages, three pages long. Will that yeah. be the entire enforcement document that's sent <laughs> well, out to the government? Frank, frankly, you, wait, wait, how many what, pages? Agree with and don't how many agree. pages right, let's talk, of guidelines? Let's go down the list. Let's go down the list. Let's go down the list. I'm going to ask how many pages of interpretation will be written by non-elected bureaucrats well, to enforce of, first those? First of all, I want to know if you agree or disagree with the proposal. That's right. what I want to know. Here. There they are. I'll I've got them right here in front of me. All right. Okay. Let's talk about, you know, I told you I think it's just going to, it's a, it's a, it's bureaucracy at its best. All we're going to be doing is hiring more employees to oversee something that's not going to work. And uh, proposed rulemaking to give law enforcement the ability to run a full background check on an individual before returning a seized gun. Do you think that's not happening now? Oh, yeah, I know it's not happening. Well. It's not happening. I mean, do you think it should have been happening already? Yeah. I, I do, too. Well, now but, then, what do we got to do? We're going to have to hire some people to make that happen? No, you're requiring them to do the background check that they had available to them before they return a weapon that was seized. Actually, That's the all. NRA has pushed for extensive background checks for years and actually been fought by the gun control people over it. Hold on. Yeah. Wait, Public, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Well, I just, no, we agree, well, Franklin. Them, there's no problem. Are you agreeing with it sure, or disagreeing? there's no problem with So number with that. one you've agreed with. So let's go to number two. I, I published a letter from the Al uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives, the ATF, to Pedri. Licensed gun dealers provided guidance on how to run background checks for private sellers. Anybody got a problem with that? They, they gonna already do it. Do it. The, here's the problem with no, that. No, apparently no, there's some Franklin, misunderstandings no, about no, how no, you do it. No, no, no. There's no misunderstandings on well, how to do it. Do you have it. a problem with that order, John? Yes, I do. Tell me why. Well, Bureaucracy. it's a private sale, Franklin. 
the problem with that is once you look at the scope of it, are you, you, what you're saying now is any private contraction between uh, John Doe and John Smith, who live side by side, they now have to involve the government in a private transaction between the two of them. Do you, you know, you're one of the good people that was so upset at the invasions of privacy of the of the Patriot Act. You're now saying the federal government will stick their nose into private sales between private individuals. No, that's not what the order says. To John. federally the licensed gun, gun dealers, dealers. providing what guidance is, on how to run back how you how to, Listen, how do you, No, 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 Wait Franklin. We're going to hire a consulting sentence. firm. To show these guys how to run a background no, check. That's no, what no. I hear. Send a read, letter read to the them. list. Re, read the end of the wait, sentence, Steve. A letter wait, to them. Wait, wait. Publish a letter from the Bureau on Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms and Explosives (ATF) to federally licensed gun dealers, providing guidance on how to run background checks for private sellers. That's right. So what no, we're no, talking. Stop. So what we're talking about wait, here. Wait, wait, wait. Private no, sellers. No. Private sellers. Who are selling to federally authorized gun dealers? No, that's what it's talking. I about. don't think that's what that's talking about at all. That's talking about he want. It's the gun show loophole. You've got a private seller, mm -hmm. and there's no background check between John Doe and John Smith, who sell one sells a gun to the other. There's no background check. What this is saying is those people are now going to be required to go to a federal firearms licensed dealer and have a background check before they can privately sell that gun that's to their not neighbor. What it says. That is what it says. That's not what it says. All right. Now, uh, here's another one. Launch a national safe and responsible gun ownership campaign. What's wrong with that? Well, that, the we, only do, we, do, we do a national fire safety program. We do safety in federal parks. We do all sorts of things like that. We do nutrition in our schools. We do all sorts of information. Well, what's how much do you think? With, what's wrong with promoting safe well, firearm? Actually, let me let me say, there's not anything wrong with it as long as you're not duplicating services. That's right. Uh, in 1988, the NRA started the Eddie Eagle Gun Safe Program. It's been reached more than 25 million children in 50 states. It's free. It teaches them to. This is the the whole program. If you see a gun, stop. Don't touch. Leave the area. Tell an adult. That's an NRA program that's been around 30 years that they've run for free. It doesn't advocate guns. Matter of fact, Eddie Eagle never touches a gun. It's actually not allowed to be done in any environment where a gun is present. There's a program the NRA's been doing for 30 years. Do welcome welcome to the, the party, Franklin. Do welcome Obama to the party. The order? Yes. I don't right, want to spend I don't want to spend the money on that crap. Okay. Don't want to spend the money right. on telling people how to be safe with their guns. The NRA's let already the, doing the, it for the, free let, with no let, taxpayer yeah. money. Let, let the uh, public do it. Uh, review safety standards for gun locks and gun safes. Consumer Product Safety Commission. Mm -hmm. You think What's that's that going to cost any more money? For years and years, I've heard the NRA promoting that type of no, behavior. No, 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 Franklin. Here's our point. If you're using a gun lock, how many people have been injured through the improper use of a gun lock? And gun safes. Well, then why are we spending government money telling them how to properly use a gun lock? The gun lock's already there. Mm -hmm. I can tell you, no, no, no. it's That's not, not a high what it technology. Says, John, you just change this stuff no, every time you read, talk. No, read it, it again, says Steve. review safety wait standards wait minute, for them. Wait what who, is an who is the problem? Lock? Who is the problem with these guns? It's not the people that are responsible. It's not the people oh, really? that are responsible. Every time a, a child dies in somebody's home because they accidentally picked up a gun All right. that, that wasn't didn't properly have a right. lock on it. It's not a problem? No, Franklin, wait a the problem is Come it's on. not that the gun lock failed. It's that the owner, the citizen, right. didn't use it. Exactly. Well, so then. what's wrong what's with promoting more safety? What I mean, this is what? this is ridiculous. You can promote you it guys, all you want. Franklin, you guys Franklin. would be against apple pie if Franklin, Obama came Franklin. out for it. Now, I don't want to mention any ridiculous. names, and I hate to even bring this up, but there was a state trooper recently who laid his pistol down at home, at his home, and a grandchild picked it up, mm -hmm. and uh, the gun was not properly taken care of. Sure. And the uh, grandchild was dead. Mm -hmm. Now then, I don't know who this gentleman was, but I can tell you that person has suffered no, terribly. terribly since this has happened. Now then, he was well-trained on what to do and how to do it. Uh -huh. Okay? Accidents do happen. Yeah. Now then, we can't change the world and start spending a lot of money and doing a lot of crazy things on things that are not going to help. If we want to do something that's going to help gun violence, why don't we start in Hollywood? 
I went to a movie a few weeks ago. I don't ever go to movies. Haven't been to movies in years. I had to set through six advertisements for future movies there, and I'm telling you, I felt like I needed to get up and leave. I thought I was about to be attacked in that movie theater from the violence that was going on in it. It's absolutely a problem in coming from Hollywood that nobody's addressing. And if they'd start there, I think that we could get to the bottom of what these crazies are thinking when they're going by and getting guns and walking in schools and unloading on them. I think it's another form of terrorism, and we need to do something about it. I think we need to take a break. You're listening to Backfire with Steve Hickson. We'll be right back after this. You are listening to WOOPLP, Cleveland, Tennessee. Whoop FM is a broadcasting service of the Traditional Music Resource Center, and we play America's original music. Check into, check into cash. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Short on cash? Check into cash gives you more money for your title and the lowest title loan rate anywhere. If you already have a title loan, ask Check into Cash about paying it off. No credit check, no run around. Check into cash won't slow you down. Check into cash loans you the most for your title. Get the lowest rate on a title loan and the most money only at Check into Cash. Check into Check into cash. Whoa, 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 whoa. We'll beat any rates that don't pay the max. Oh, yeah. Check into cash is your money machine. Get on up and get down. Check into cash. Free proof of lower rate on similar title loan restrictions apply. Visit checkintocash.com for the store nearest you. Hi, this is Glenn from U.S. Money Shops. If you need up to $2,500 in quick cash and have a clear title on your vehicle, visit your nearest U.S. Money Shops and get a title loan. Ask about our low rate, and chances are you'll be shocked at how competitive we are. So come on down to U.S. Money Shops. 